the biggest question for me is how we got from what we were in, say, 1919 to where we were in, in World War II. It's not a trivial thing. If you go back. That's back. Forward. That's back. Okay. Forward. Well, first of all, what did we do that was special? And by the way, we were a lot worse in 1919 than you might imagine, and a lot better in 1941. And, oh well, uh, and, and of course you want to know how well we did and how, the, how what we did affected World War II performance. Okay, uh, if you look, this is what you might think of as 1919, but there's more to it that's worse. And that is that we don't have a, an integrated fleet that, that encompasses a lot of different kinds of ships, what we have is a battle line. And then we have other kinds of ships, but we don't really know how to combine them. Uh, one of the big shocks that we get when we operate with the British is that the Grand Fleet is an integrated fleet and we're not. Well, anyway, we go from this, which looks good, but won't win, to this, which wins big. And uh, there, there have been writers who say that, well, we, we first learned about aircraft carriers in December 1941. Good luck. We didn't. We learned about them a lot earlier, and we were rather good at it. In fact, uh, it may shock you that we were the leading carrier navy in the world between wars. That's certainly what the British thought, and I think the Japanese always claimed that uh, they followed us. On the other hand, they were being interrogated after losing the war. And, might conceivably have wanted to make us feel good. Never guess. Um, how do you create an integrated fleet? Not just carriers, but how do you make people fit together? How do you search for an enemy fleet in something as big as the Pacific? How do you fight a Pacific War anyway? What is a Pacific War? And that's the hardest of all. Now, we did it by wargaming at the Naval War College. And if you went to the Naval War College, uh, you got to play a series of fairly small games that lasted about a week. And then there was the big game, which was a month. And the big game was everyone participated. And it, it envisaged a Pacific War or a large chunk of war. Now, you got to realize that means that you're forced to face all the questions that come up in a very big transoceanic war. You're forced to face logistics, you're forced to face scouting. How do you find the other side? I mean, they don't come up and, and wave a little flag saying, we're here, uh, come blow us up, right? Um, one of the neat things about wargaming is that unlike uh, a fleet exercise, you can afford to have things go wrong. In a big fleet exercise, I'm not saying that they're rigged, but they're, they're rigged in a sense because they cost so much to put on that everyone has to get a chance to play. And that means that there'll be artificialities that, that don't really have much to do with a real war. Whereas in a game, uh, you can arrange things so that uh, there are unfortunate messages that you learn. I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a game sometime about 1934 in which um, the Japanese don't find us as we leave Pearl Harbor to go west. There's a typical fixture in these games that the fleet would start at Pearl Harbor and the Japanese would have submarines around Hawaii that were supposed to pick up the fleet as it came out. And we would depth charge the submarines in hopes that they couldn't come up in time to find out what was happening. Normally, some of them did. In this one game, no one did. And the fleet took an unexpected route. It went north instead of south. And uh, it went around the Aleutians. And for about three weeks in the game, Japanese commander couldn't find out what was happening. So he's frantically looking. Now, eventually, he finds out we're in the Aleutians, and there's a battle, and we, we get mashed, and they get mashed, you know, whatever you expect. But just the experience of what happens if you lose sight of the other side? must have been extremely educational. You couldn't do that with a big fleet exercise because everyone who wasn't finding the other fleet would be wasted, basically. And that's, that's only part of it. Part of a Pacific War is, is learning what real logistics means. Part of it is learning all the ways that you can get wiped out. Okay. Um, 
we saw this is the future, this is language, but we also learned what you needed in the way of combat logistics. There's a very interesting game played in 1933, I think. Right? It's a typical cross Pacific game. Uh, we fight the Japanese actually near Surgao Strait, uh, which is misspelled in the, the write up of the game. Um, but the Naval War College at that time had a very tough captain named Van Auken, who was supposed to evaluate the results of each game. And uh, Van Auken, the great thing about the Naval War College at that time was that they could shut up so that uh, whatever they learned stayed in Newport and in Washington, but didn't go into the newspapers, something that's inconceivable, right? Mm -hmm. So um, Van Orkin said, well, when you win this battle, right, there are more Japanese ships sunk than American, but uh, you take some underwater damage, don't you? And, um, you know, as long as your pumps keep running, you're okay. But of course, you're going to have to turn them off at some point, at which point your fleet will sink. Do you really think that's a satisfactory outcome? And he said almost those words. He was, he was quite outspoken. And the answer is, of course, it's not. So in this particular case, his comments and summary of the game went to CNO. I don't think that ever happened in another, another case of gaming. And the result was, well, maybe the, the naval strategy that we've adopted is flawed. The strategy at that time was called the true ticket to Manila. And I have to explain that when you talk about the strategy of the Pacific War, we would begin by asking, well, what is it that you're trying to get? And the answer was, you're trying to get Japan to fold. Um, it's better than, than trying to defend the Philippines, which turned out to be impossible. Uh, basically, after they surrender, they'll give up whatever they've stolen, right? Well, that means that you have to find something that will force the Japanese to surrender. And our answer was strangulation. Incidentally, by 1929, the war planners say, well, what happens if the Japanese don't get the message? If they don't realize that once they're under blockade, it's over. How do you deal with them? And the answer was, you bomb them to smithereens. Uh, the, the cities were all made out of paper, you burn them down. And it turns out that the requirement of blockade and the requirement of a strategic bombing offensive are the same. You have to have islands around Japan from which you can mount either kind of operation. So it turns out that from the Navy's point of view, it really doesn't matter which way you play. Anyhow, um, if you want to do that, you have to destroy the shield that the Japanese have to protect their lighter forces and their, their small islands. That's called, you've got to destroy the Japanese Navy. But the point I'm trying to make is that when people look at this, and, oh yeah, yeah, the Americans, they're only thinking of the big fleet engagement and a lot of glory. Oh no, no. We're thinking of what you have to do to get to winning that war. That's a much more sophisticated point of view, right? At any rate, what you get out of this 1934 discovery is that you have to have some means of repairing the fleet of forward areas. You have to get a logistics base that moves forward with the fleet. And you're not going to go straight to the Far East. You're going to seize places on route. It's called a step-by-step -step advance. And that changes the problem the Japanese have to face. But for a while, we do our best to keep the whole thing very quiet. When they first play one of these things at the War College, President of the War College says, this is just an idea of a different way to fight. Don't talk about it. And it's, it's kind of an interesting speech. Previously, the usual speech at the start of a big war game was, this is the rest of your careers. Look carefully at what's going on. That was in 1927. Anyhow, this is also part of where you've got to go. There's a sense of what kind of Navy you're developing to fight this war. Not just the bits, but the bits are normally what you see, right? So what was the, the war college like between the wars? Um, you start out, and if you look at the war college archive, 
you see a lot of, of lectures of various sorts. And you might be led to believe that they tell you what people learned at the War College. However, uh, my impression is that they were sort of supplemental reading, that really what happened at the War College is a lot of gaming to give an officer a sense of what commanding a higher level fleet would be like. I mean, you're, say, a lieutenant commander. You, you run a destroyer. You go there as a junior officer. You're being taught what the next couple of steps in your career have to be like, right? And the next steps have to be higher level commands. If you look at the senior course, how do you understand what operating fleet is like? When, let's say, your, your big experience in operating, say, a cruiser squadron, like Admiral Strauss. Well, that's how, right? And it's learning by doing with very little reliance on what you're told. That's my impression. That's the best I can do to explain what was going on. I should have started by saying all this stuff comes out of a project I did for the Naval History and Heritage Command. Uh, they wanted to know about wargaming in Newport between wars. That was the entire uh, requirement. And I'm not a wargamer. So I'm interested in what the impact of wargaming was on the Navy. Okay? So I, I won't talk to you about changes in the rules of wargaming or the techniques they had, but I'm interested in what wargaming did for the Navy and how it transformed the Navy. What you find is that they're learning how to use new kinds of weapons very early on. For example, in the early 20s, before we had an operational carrier, carriers figure heavily in their fleet operations. In fact, uh, one of their officers is the only one in their entire period who manages to beat off an air attack on a carrier completely, several reeves. And that convinces him that he needs a lot of airplanes. And that convinces him when he gets to uh, Langley, as commander of the squadrons, that they have to find some way to add aircraft to her operation. That's where our, our way of operating carriers came from. That wasn't from somebody's abstract ideas. So we have to give a sense of command. We have to give a sense of what a big naval war would be like that we've never fought in our lives. And we have to invent tactics. Uh, the two that I can think of that are probably not the only two by any means are the circular formations and the uh, uh, fight the uh, carrier operation, which is a very big thing. The carrier operation ultimately is why at Midway we have three carriers and they have as many aircraft at least as the four Japanese. Okay. So the question is, well, well how do you fight a Pacific War? And the, the problem that you face is that however you fight it, the Japanese have these mandated islands that we have to pass through. And we assume that the mandates would be heavily fortified, which by the way, they weren't pre-war. And they would have a lot of airfields. Uh, the reason that we require our aircraft to have very high performance was that they would face Japanese land-based air. If you go to the Royal Navy, you find that uh, they kidded themselves into believing that carrier aircraft were inherently low performance, and therefore there was no such requirement. Uh, Wargaming apparently was a very good antidote to kidding yourself. And, and that last one is the through ticket or not. And when the through ticket dies, we really have to think through other stuff. You find that a lot of other stuff suddenly comes up. You find that the fleet landing exercises, well, if you're going to have to grab islands, that's what you'll have to do. You find the Marines repurposed towards invading islands in the Pacific. That was not present in the early 30s. There's a lot of consequences to this stuff. And I think that the, the, the biggest contribution was that one war game and Van Orkin's comments on it. He had other comments that were interesting. Uh, they fought a big naval game against the British. It was a two-year game. And then Oakland wrote first, uh, what this is going to teach you is that uh, 
you're not going to fight a big naval war unless it's a big national decision. This thing eats resources like you wouldn't believe. It also uses up cruisers very rapidly. And uh, he says, well, you know, cruisers aren't that easy to build. So if you're going to fight a big war, you better have an ally. Well, that's pretty obvious. But this is 1931, when the United States is very isolationist. And you couldn't say such things, right? So the fact that he could say it is a reflection of my view that they knew how to shut up. Um, so the war plan is completely changed after the CNO gets the message. Now, that's not about transformation because the transformation to an integrated fleet, the Italians, that comes earlier. Incidentally, the, the change in the war plan uh, allows us to make much greater use of uh, flying boats uh, because the Graven Island, you can move in some large flying boats. If you can get high enough performance, they can be long range bombers. And you notice that, that when the Navy puts the B in designations like PBY, uh, that reflects putting in the Northern bomb site. They think they can be bombers. I know that that turns out well badly. You know, not everything turns out cleverly when you start out. But, by the way, I think my voice is going to help. But can you still hear me in the back? more or less. All right. So what they learned from this 1933 game is, first of all, you're not going to have any quick decision. Well, they probably already suspected that. Um, there'll be large losses. By the way, if you follow the, the Naval War College evaluation of carrier battles, uh, you would not want to be a pilot on a carrier. Your chances of surviving the war would be somewhat limited. But you know, people were crazy and they were willing. Um, there'll be large noises. You've got to have national industrial mobilization. And we did. Uh, this isn't the first time they realized that there would have to be repairs in forward areas, but they took it a lot more seriously than they have in the past. And I think that the Maritime Commission is part of the story. I've never seen that said. When the Maritime Commission advertised itself, ah, now I'll be able to speak better. About 1937 or 38, there's a, uh, a paper written by the then chief of the Maritime Commission explaining what their purpose is. And he mentions that the Navy is going to need a lot of auxiliaries if there's a war, and they're providing the hulls for these auxiliaries, which they did. You know that. Uh, I wonder whether that came also out of this change in war plans. Because if you believe that you're going to be moving your logistics forward, then a lot of the logistics will be tenders and things like that. Uh, we did not have the floating dry docks until the war, which we should have had, but we were broke. So you do some things, you can't have everything. So I've never seen anyone who put that together. But I suspect that it will go together if you look in the right places. Uh, P.S. I once tried to look at Maritime Commission records and they're a mess. Uh, what do we learn? The first thing, again, if you look at American naval aircraft between wars, we go for very high performance. It isn't just because it's fun to have a good high performance airplane. You have to sacrifice to get high performance. Even if you think of a, a wildcat as not all that hot, um, it's pretty good. And of course, as soon as we get the 2000 horsepower engines, we get really good Corsairs and Hellcats. If you look at other navies in the West, look at the Royal Navy, they never get it. There's a reason they fly US airplanes in World War II. It isn't just production. Um, carriers have to keep fighting after they get hit because there are going to be a lot of battles. And if you look at even Yorktown, which is before this game, you look at a lot of effort to provide what I would call a combat survivability. Now, you may be laughing because you think of that flimsy wooden flight deck, you know? But actually, that's a survivability feature because it can be repaired on the hoof, you know? If you have a nice steel armored deck like the British had that everyone 
It mires and a bomb goes through it. You're going to a shipyard for six months or more. Right? You're sure as hell not staying in combat. And we did other things. Um, and Essex is supposed to be able to, to uh, steam air at very high speed for a sustained period. That's because in the event that one end of the flight deck is blown off, they want to use the other end. Uh, the original design of the Yorktown and the Essex includes catapults on the hangar deck. That's so if you lose the, the flight deck, you can still watch airplanes. That's very serious attention to what happens if you've got to stay in combat for a long time. It didn't work out that way in World War II. We got rid of the hangar deck catapults, and we really don't experience a lot of uh, flight deck damage after 1942, right? Until the Kamikazes. But if you look at Midway, uh, Yorktown managed to repair her flight deck and resume flight, flight operations during the battle. Now, you may not think that's a big deal. Find somebody else's carriers who did that. We'll have a rough time. Uh, this thing, to me, explains both the rate of production we saw and the rate of production of pilots that we saw. If you look at what happens to Japanese, uh, they don't go for a lot of reserve pilots. You know that. Any. Um, when they lose their pilots, it takes them a couple of years to recover. We didn't take a couple of years to recover. What did we do? 40,000 pilots in World War II? Um, the submarine thing is interesting. Uh, there's a game in the late 30s in which we use US submarines among other things to attack commerce in the South China Sea. And uh, the idea at that time is that, that the commerce attack is a way of diverting Japanese attention while we do something else. I forget what the else was. One of the lessons of that was uh, <clears throat> we had two submarines attacking the merchant ship. One was uh, following the usual rules. They call the cruiser rules, you know, when you stop the merchant ship, find out how bad they are, attack them only if they carry the wrong stuff. The other was uh, unrestricted submarine warfare. You sink it. Well, the cruiser world submarine itself was sunk within the first week or so. Okay, she almost stopped. Uh, the other sub did fine. Uh, unfortunately, it sank some neutrals, sank a British tanker. And the British were, were giving them a very hard time about it. But <clears throat> to me, the lesson was very simple. If you do submarine warfare, make it unrestricted, otherwise it won't work. And you know, in 1941, we kind of got that message. Now, I have no documentation saying we learned this and therefore, but it seems rather persuasive to me. Now, in 1941, also, we were watching a German unrestricted submarine warfare campaign, which was doing unpleasantly well. And I imagine that has something to do with our decision also. You can tell I'm not a fan of that book by the international lawyer at the Newport. Okay, this is another one that's interesting. If you look at those games, um, they give you a somewhat different view of how the Pacific War was envisaged and of how it was played out. One of the things that's interesting about the way the rules are framed is that unlike the British, um, there is absolutely no contempt of the Japanese. Japanese uh, players in the games are Americans. Uh, usually in, in the language of that era, um, there is a, a section in the, the setup for racial traits. And the only racial trait given to the Japanese is they'll fight fanatically, which is pretty accurate. Um, the other thing is that we, we have some inkling that their army and navy don't get along terribly well. But nothing like actually happen. So you get a sense of what the Japanese would do if they weren't Japanese. That is, what features of their operations were, were just sort of forced by the situation and not by anything personal. Um, you obviously don't get suicide attacks. 
although that would come under the tobacco fighting stuff. But um, the night actions come up a lot. And it's sort of, yeah, there are things called torpedoes and you don't have a lot of ships. So you yeah, look at that. Yeah. Um, things in these games work a lot better than in real life, unfortunately. So you can get a sense of what they were doing that was different. It always seems to me that you want to do comparisons because if you don't, you may assign differences to people which aren't really different, okay? So it seemed to me reading these, these things that it was kind of interesting to ask those, kind, those kinds of questions. I'm not a Pacific War historian. I don't have the kind of uh, ready familiarity with, with the actions that I should have had, but it certainly felt this way. And a lot of stuff gets, gets tried in the games. Um, Van Orken left a, a paper on uh, game experience when he retired from the war college. And uh, one of the students had tried a, an attack on Tokyo from a carrier. <clears throat> and Van Orkin's comment was, we don't know how to score this, but it's something that you should know about. Not bad, no? Yeah. Well, there's some other questions. Um, after the, the War College did this, <clears throat> suddenly it went down the drain. And I don't know why, I try to find out. That is, until 1934, the War College is part of the Office of Chief Naval Operations. It's their lab, it's their strategic lab, right? And then suddenly, um, it becomes part of the Navy educational system. And there's no way you don't read that as a demotion, right? Um, if you look at discussions of new types of ships, until 1934, the president of the War College is always involved and generally says something like, in our games, we learned that. You'll never find that after 1934. It goes away. And I associate the going away with the change of status. I have no idea why that happened. It would be a very interesting subject. Did the Japanese catch on to the change of strategy? If you read Shattered Sword, there were references to their increasing interest in operating further and further from Japan. And I can imagine that they got interested in what we were doing. I can imagine they were good enough at spying to figure it out at some point. I think it took them about two or three years. But I think that if I knew the Japanese story better, I would start talking about when they started reacting to what we were going to do. I just don't know the answer to that, but it's an interesting question. And uh, I think that's when they got real interested in land-based naval air attack. Because if you, that step-by-step -step strategy is really an unpleasant mess. If, if you don't know which island we're gonna grab as the first step, how do you oppose us? I mean, once the island is under attack, yeah, you know where we really are, but you're far away, it's, you'll never get there in time. So, I think that's when they got interested in what they call shuttle bombing later, right? Because you can, if you have an airstrip on the island that will be hit, then you can move in aircraft to start doing something about it. I don't know when they first got interested in this, and I'm not sure how much development there had been done before the war. Originally, the very long range Japanese land based bombers were partly to reconnoiter Pearl Harbor so they'd have warning that the fleet was coming out. That goes with the, the, the through ticket to the North strategy. Then they were given bomb loads. So if, if you have a, a G3 or a G4M, it has a substantial bomb load. It also has unbelievable range. Uh, I don't know at what point they decided that it would have a useful role in this kind of war or even whether they did decide that. My knowledge of Japanese naval strategy is limited, but I get the impression from what I've read that it's limited in general. Uh, finally, 
This stuff was all done for the Naval History and Heritage Command. It was written up. There's a book called Winning a Future War. And even better than that, you get it for free by downloading it off their website. Um, I would never have gone through the war gaming material they have if I hadn't been paid to do it. It's an unbelievable amount of material. Every time I was in their archive, I would stare at folders of it and look away with horror. Um, I give you an account of the gaming. I don't talk a lot about the rules and how they changed. I'm mostly interested, as I've said, in what the impact of it was. I think it had enormous impact. Um, I looked through all the available gaming material. That is, you get the scenarios, you get the setup by the staff, because um, in order to have a game, you have to have a lot of people in subordinate roles. So unless somebody on the staff figured out what the basic US policy was gonna be, you couldn't form it. The students all had to form their own ideas of policy, but that will stop before they had the, the big game. Had to. Um, so you get that. You get sometimes a write up of how the game came out, not always by any means. You also sometimes get the, the post game brush up, which often has um, people at the War College who had lot of free experience commenting on how they thought things would have happened in real life. And that can be very illuminating, although uh, more for real life than for talking about what Newport did. Um, it's not all at Newport. Uh, there's stuff at the uh, uh, War Plan Division in Washington uh, at, at the Archives College Park. Um, when you realize that the war gaming were their lab, then you understand why the <coughs> war plans division should have a lot of them too. So it seemed to me that I had a fair shot. Now I wanted to know what others did. And I looked at the British. Uh, you can't find, as far as I can tell, any account of comparable British efforts. I don't think they ran war games for real. Um, we had an officer who visited their senior naval war college. And what he got was that um, at the end of their course, they had a week long game to examine some aspect of their war plan. You know, I'm sorry, but a week long game at the end of your class when you're sort of looking forward to leave afterwards probably doesn't have a lot of impact on any of it. And in particular, I don't think it had much impact on, on people asking really searching questions. It's not that sort of society. Now they had a junior war college, which was teaching tactics and they used gaming extensively, but I think they used it mainly to uh, instruct officers in the tactics they should be employing, TN tactics. They did have, they were up against the Japanese also. Uh, one of the ironies of, of interwar history is that both we and the British had the same target in mind. And I don't think we ever caught on. So instead of saying, oh, are you gonna, you gonna deal with them too? Or how about uh, talking it out together? There was some, some collaboration at uh, the last uh, uh, treaty conference, but there was not that sense that we're in the same boat, aren't we? And uh, that's sort of unfortunate for both navies. At any rate, I've never seen any account of, of serious British gaming to test their ideas. You know, if you look at our gaming, the fact that we discovered that our war plan stank and that we changed it, it's pretty amazing, right? You don't expect that. And it's, it's all there. It's not like it's hidden someplace. You don't find anything remotely like that with the British. The other thing about the British is that um, the British don't really integrate naval air into their thinking. Um, the British tactical school had a pair of dioramas. One was Jutland, and the other was Jutland as it would have been fought with what are our recent innovations. You can't fight Jutland if you have aircraft because you'll see what's going on, right? Forget about you, you also bomb the Germans before they get anywhere near you. 
Uh, I also ran into a British document in 36 when they're about to get control of the key air arm, which explains to naval officers what airplanes are. It, it's a little bit better than that, but I'll uh, The clueless. I don't know about Japanese gaming. Um, the impression I got from uh, Jim's book about Pearl Harbor was that the gaming tended to be of the narrative sort, where you see where the pieces fit together, but you don't really have an active enemy try to throw wrenches into your, your operation. But we had an active enemy. The Japanese side could win. There was no attempt to make sure they didn't. And we did better than we did early in the war, no question. Um, a lot of stuff worked that didn't work later, we know that. Uh, there's certainly a fair amount of fantasy in the pre war Navy. I, I'll just close with it. The biggest fantasy I saw. Uh, you don't think of level bombing as a really good way of attacking ships, right? Especially if they're maneuvering. Okay. Before the war, we had a, a handbook of how you fought daily at war. And it included a mathematical demonstration of how terrific level bombing by formations would be. And uh, I've never seen instructions tear out these pages and burn them. It would have been a good idea. Anyway, um, that's all I have. And I hope you find it interesting. I know I'm open for uh, counter battery fire. Yeah. Questions, uh, any questions you have? We might entertain questions from uh, anybody who has questions from one of your other books. Sure. So, I'm here and I'm, I'll, I'll stand up to fire. So, Norman Cole, um, I think when Bob you told the story about uh, the pre war Japanese military, he made a point that for cultural reasons, at least it was, it was not considered a, uh, acceptable to consider defeat in a war game or in a plan. To I can believe that. Uh, if you can't consider defeat, you'll get to experience it in real life. The other, the other question I have is um, when we gave up the, the through ticket idea, it, it sounds to me like MacArthur never got that word. Oh, it's worse than that. It's much worse than that. Uh, when MacArthur was chief of staff, he had to sign on to the current version of the war plan orange. In this version, uh, the Philippines holds on, holds, holds up as long as he can, and then surrenders. And uh, he never he conveniently forgot all that stuff later. Oh, you bet he never caught on. Because you must understand that, that MacArthur had a very simple view of the world. Wherever he was, was the center of the earth. And uh, anything that didn't support that, look, MacArthur managed to make the case that Korea was the center of the Cold War. If you can say that with a straight face, I mean, the giving up on the two tickets, nothing. He was astounding. And um, there, are other, there are other issues like the, the army thought that the issue of the Pacific War was recovering the Philippines. That's in their official history. The Navy never looked at it like that. It was the issue was defeating Japan and they'll call up afterwards. Sure. Oh, MacArthur is amazing. Well, first off, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. I know we all really appreciate it. I think my central question I have when it came to the uh, sort of strategic planning that went on through these games is how much examination there truly was over this idea of, you know, undertaking the strangulation of Japan. Because I see when you're saying that there was an understanding of how fanatical the Japanese would be. Was there still just an assumption at that time that they would be able to undertake a blockade or surrender? Or was there really among the actual games and the discussions going on? Was there a real thought to once we actually succeed in going over like an island on campaign as to what sort of end game or scenario would be if there was serious talk about an invasion and how they thought this sort of ending would like be a sort of scenario? It's a very good question. Um, I got the impression that we never did really try to resolve that. Uh, early on, I've seen war gaming, uh, war planning documents from the 20s. And, and they, they concluded that invasion was not possible because we'd never raised that big an army. Uh, 
you know, it vanished a lot in World War I, but it would never come back. Uh, I don't know when invasion was first raised in World War II. And I, I just never looked. But no, they, they, they didn't think these things through completely. Uh, and by the way, in the games, Japanese being fanatics doesn't turn up either. Uh, it's just it's a sort of throwaway combat without thinking it through. Uh, I don't think we had a very clear idea of how they thought. Now, I know with the British, uh, they similarly imagined the strangulation. And early on, one of their officers said, wait a second, the Japanese have access to resources in China. What makes you think you can really shut them down? Now, of course, once they start fighting in China, they, they lose that access. Um, similarly, they lose access by the transit and things like that. Um, I don't think that that was really a question. Now, I remember reading Miller's book on Warplane Orange, and uh, I don't think he raises that. Now, uh, I remember hearing his talks versus seeing it, seeing it in print. And the talks were, I think, better about the switch from through ticket to step by step. Uh, I think that he decided to be very liberal in his politics. And uh, he thought the through ticket was uh, Admiral strutting around the like, oh, moment. Uh, before that, it was just, you know, that was the way you, you do it. And then, of course, oh dear, it doesn't work. Um, no, and they should have. But the, the, the degree to which we had an integrated government thinking through this kind of stuff, I don't think it really existed. I, I also have a nasty feeling that people in Washington, other than the Navy Department, had not the slightest clue to what they discussed, where they, they should have. It's sad. How clue, how clueful are they now? So, um, obviously, this is sort of the war game that's taking place ashore, and during the same time, you've got the yearly fleet problem that's taking place at sea. Right. Um, when you were looking at, at this, did you find any evidence that the war college was taking forward the lessons that they were learning from fleet problems? Or like, oh, absolutely. Well? The, the fleet problems gave them uh, information on how things were supposed to work. And, and yes, they, they absolutely took that into account. They tried very hard to be realistic. The one thing they were not able to model at all realistically was air to air combat. And they tried. It wasn't like we don't care. Uh, they tried with gun cameras, but they admitted it didn't work. And they, they reached bizarre conclusions like that uh, multi seat airplanes with rear firing guns would beat off fighters every time. No. But yeah. But uh, I don't think anyone took that seriously. And they would do things like you know, try to figure out what your chances of hitting were if you dive bomber. And it, there's one point at which the, the dive bomber pilot at War College says, no, we'll do better in wartime when we work an animal. And they said, no, nah, there'll be other bad things that happen all the time. Hold that behavior. But yeah, they tried it. Um, they were very aware of the problems. You find the problem. Uh, accounts in their papers. Um, the one thing that they were not able to do was to model uh, some of the communications of the rest. Uh, they, they thought they were, but I think it was more than they. But yeah, they, they were they were not done. Yeah. Did the US ever do any sort of war gaming about something during like the annual draft? Uh, we didn't do alliances. We did against the British. We, we did games against them. And I think the purpose was to find whether we like to go up against somebody of their size. Uh, I don't think we, we took the possibility of an Anglo Japanese alliance that seriously. Remember, this is all after the Washington Conference, which has been broken. Uh, we certainly did think about what happens if you sink neutral shipping with US Japanese war. They worried about the British coming in on the Japanese side. How realistic any of that was. Oh, I'll give you another example of gross realism. The 1934 game where we go to the Aleutians. The reason we go to the Aleutians is that we had to deal with the Russians. They will come into the war if we're able to reach, uh, I guess, Kamchatka. And if you believe that, I can sell you a 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think uh, part of the answer is why the American British didn't working together in this time is between the wars that you see that for a long period of time we had a very difficult time seeing ourselves as an ally. I know in uh, diplomatic uh, negotiations, we do have the Berlin Invasion Conferences, Washington and Trayvon, I think it was the first London Conference, and uh, the failed Geneva Conference before that, uh, particularly on the British side, where they saw the Americans not as allies, but as uh, competitors. And I doubt if they seriously thought about cooperating with each other uh, at any high level. Well, there's this very interesting British document that was came across from about 1924. And the title is something like uh, Possible Allies in the Pacific War. And they conclude that we would be the best, but we can't be trusted. And that's because they're very bitter at us for having waited so long to come into World War One. On the other hand, uh, they kid themselves about their own resources, and they didn't—they didn't want to accept that their resources were much more limited than they want them to be. Now you see that later uh, during World War Two, they're talking about the future of the Royal Navy post-war, right? And it's an enormous navy; they can't possibly pay for it. And apparently their officers don't want to know about, you know, grungy things like money. We, we don't like that either, but we have a somewhat more realistic view of life. Uh, the other thing is that our resources were unbelievably greater than anybody else's. That, that's come off in a recent book, and I think Paul Kennedy will talk about that tomorrow. Uh, it's basically we dwarf everybody else. I think we're bigger than the next three economies. So what you see with the British partly is that, that real life doesn't empower the country very deep. And there, there are other examples of it. There's extraordinary things. In the 1930s, they're talking about what their next battleship should be like. 1938. Uh, we've just demanded that they raise the, the limit on battleship size because the Japanese are back and forth. And there's a conference in which they say, well, what's going to happen now? And the basis of the conference is we can't afford anything bigger than 40,000 tons. And the Americans want 45. And the first sea lord says, I'm going to stake everything on keeping it down to 40. By the way, when we, when we puffed the foreign office, this goes away. Uh, and they their estimates of what's going to happen are based entirely on what will, what they would like, not even on, on what they think anyone else would like. By way of contrast, when the Naval War College is asked what people have been doing the way of building cruisers in 1930, which is a big deal at that time, um, they start with asking what the Japanese were going to do, because we have to face it. That's why we got built big cruisers at that time, the Brooklyn's. The British had assumed that. Uh, everyone would want to go cheap. They were able to go cheap on a six inch gun cruiser, and therefore, going six inch guns would save them economically. Right. And they discovered it wasn't going to save them any more economically than anything else. That, that's where the big British six inch cruisers come from, and they were horribly expensive. And they didn't like them at all. Oh, so, there's a lot of questions. Yeah, that. I'm sorry. I haven't gone around yet. So, that's pretty good. Um, how easy was it for the Naval War College to sell their new tactics and kind of a recommendation? How do they sell new tactics to all that? Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because what, what happens is that at that time, if you're an officer going through Newport, your next job is somewhere in the fleet and you take what you've done with you. So, for example, uh, when we push the circular formations, which is a big innovation of the 1920s, Nimitz graduates the War College. He's seen them, he likes them, and he sells them to his uh, boss, who's a fleet commander. It's, it's not done by the administration of the War College, 
it's done by somebody who's actually done it there. Uh, when, when Reeves leaves the War College, having learned about how to defend the cavity of a lot of fighters, uh, he's sent, first he goes to Pensacola because he's found the right airplanes. And then he goes to the fleet, he becomes commander of, battle, of aircraft squadrons, battle fleet. And so he says, well, I learned this stuff, we're gonna do this. You gotta realize it's a much smaller Navy. It's a much smaller officer. I think about 10% of all naval officers went through Newport and they would have talked to their buddies. So things diffuse. It, it's a much less bureaucratic Navy than it is now. And that's how it's sold. The, the case in which they say to the CNO, look what we found, that's unusual. Usually I think it was, here's what I learned, let's try it. And, and there was much more of a sense of learning by doing than we get now. You don't have a separate sort of professorial system. Uh, the, the professors at the War College were mostly students who had been kept on for another year. So it's a much more informal operation. And again, um, because they kept transcripts of all the lectures, the lectures to people who are used to universities as lecture and and learn, uh, the lectures sound very important. I don't think they mattered at all. I think they were enrichment. I think that you really learned how, let's say, uh, destroyers would act in a fleet action by doing it. Oh, geez, they got eaten up, eaten alive, or boy, they ate the other guy alive. That's, that's what you would learn. That would be the, the really vivid stuff left, left by your year in the war home. Now, having been to the War College, I can't tell you that that was true, especially not having been there in the 1930s, but it smelled that way. And I would never have thought about it if I hadn't been reading all that stuff. Never, sir. Sure. Uh, as you're going through the document, did you notice the shift between using aircraft in the scout role to a more aggressive uh, tactic? Well, we had attacking aircraft from the start. Because in, in uh, Reese's, Reeves's case, uh, the Japanese are attacking him with carrier aircraft. And uh, his big achievement is that he has enough fighters that he could beat them off. And the big achievement that he has in, in using the fighters is that he manages to refuel them during the big attacks. Um, so yeah, they, they started that stuff from the get-go. Now, uh, the fleet would not have thought that way, but the war game is sure as hell did. I think that that starts like in 1923. And that's long before we had any torpedo bombers that you could ever use. I think also that the, the attacking aircraft would probably create a better performance than you get later. But I haven't really compared them. Uh, I should add that we never had good information on Japanese aircraft. We always assigned them U.S. aircraft because we, we figured that was the best we could do. We did know about British. I know we knew about swordfish being really crappy airplanes. But I don't think we realized that the British would be unable to mount heavy air attacks because of the way they operate the carriers. Oh, and, and we also rigged the rules so that we couldn't uh, win with the lucky hit. So Hood was given a lot better survivability than she turned out to have. Can't work. When you're going through the material, did you ever come across reports or suggestions relating to <coughs> taking large bodies of troops or armies and transporting them across the oceans to a distant colony or territory during wartime and how to supply them in a scenario without having to either redo the redo a plan or have to massively increase the naval capacity in order to achieve such a feat. Well, early on, you find exercise with the army where we talk about moving troops. We don't talk about opposed landings at that point. I don't think you see large numbers of troops later because if you're doing this step-by-step -step game, you really are just seizing small islands one by one. 
And the idea is that if you get one that becomes your base, you can use aircraft base there to hit other Japanese islands and that way it'll go across. So you're not gonna imagine large numbers of troops until you worry about grabbing large land masses. And if we had taken the possibility of seizing the Philippines back seriously, yeah, I think we would have talked that way, but I've never seen that. I think our idea was that seizing the Philippines was a sucker's game. If you were an army guy in the Philippines in 45, you'd probably agree. Yeah. And Norman, Jim, Jim Brandt, on the Japanese way of thinking, uh, the submarines, they had wonderful submarines long range. They only used them a couple of times off of our West Coast. Is that kind of Japanese thinking that allowed them to only transport? Well, they, they, thought of, they thought of fleet off fleet conflict. And uh, I believe that I don't know Japanese submarines as well as I'd like. But uh, they were interested in, in using them against the U.S. fleet. And then things went sour. So you, you have fairly elaborate organization with uh, uh, scout planes on subs. But I don't think that they really understood anti-shipping. And if you don't really think about anti-shipping, you're not going to use them very effectively. They did some anti-shipping. Uh, I think they did some in Australia, they did some in the Indian Ocean, but by and large, it, it didn't seem to track them. They don't seem to have thought much about logistics. I don't know why. And I'm, I'm thinking that, um, I don't think that they tried to simulate a big war. I think they got that from the British, didn't simulate it. Again, I never could get my hands on British war gaming stuff, and certainly not Japanese. So I don't have a strong feeling for how they approach a new war. And, and the things that you read are, are crazy, like, uh, oh, we, we, we need Midway to complete our defensive perimeter. Maybe don't feel like that. They're, they're very aware that between islands, there are these areas called water that they're able to go through. And there's no such thing as a defensive perimeter. So, I don't understand why people think that's how they, they were talking. Uh, it would be an army way of speaking as opposed to a Navy way. Uh, I, I've never seen a good enough account of their, their thinking at all. And that includes Kaiga, which is a good book. So, uh, so in working, they tend to fight some of the resources that Israel and Canada might Oh no, they, they tried to simulate the actual US fleet or the expected fleet. Uh, what they have. The, the, they, were, they were not doing blue sky stuff. I've always seen one case of trying something really different. Uh, there was a radio controlled torpedo that was a big deal in 1920 before it turned out to be a very low deal. And uh, that was simulated again. And it's the only case I can think of where they did something really blue sky and they discovered it was not blue sky at all. But, but generally, it was a, an idealized version of the, the actual fleet. I, I don't even think that, that you see occasional, I take it back, you see occasional things. Um, there was a, an idea called the flight deck cruise. And uh, that was a concession that had been extracted at the London Conference in 1930. And they played flight deck cruises in some of the games. Uh, by the way, it played very well in games, but the reality was not so exciting. Yeah. Your reviews of the war gaming, how big a role, if any, did amphibious warfare play in these games? Uh, you get a little of it at the very end. Uh, you don't get much. You, you get it once, once they're talking about seizing islands. Uh, when you look at the games played after they go to the new war plan, there's always a module about seizing or defending an island. And there are Marines at the war college who play in those modules. I didn't go through them. But yeah, there would be amphibious, the, the, the kind of small scale amphibious operations that the Marines were interested in, which is what you'd expect. And you know that, that we began experimenting with surf boats and we, we began learning how to do shore bombardment. Uh, they talked about assigning marine aircraft to carriers for that. Yeah. 
but only only towards the end. This question, Carmen, um, from Dave Winkler. It says, "Can you discuss the interface between the war games and fleet balance?" I know you talked a bit about that. Well, initially, you have fleet problems, which are driven by war game proposals. So there's at least one like that. Um, I don't know about the interface later because I know that the War College was very aware of what happened in the games. And I assume that the games, to some extent, reflected War College ideas. But uh, I don't know more detail than that. I know that the way that the uh, War Games and Fleet Exercises were written out, uh, they would talk about the estimated situation, which was a War College idea. And they would talk about why the fleet commander on each side had chosen what he chose to do. So there was obviously a good deal of interface. I just don't know the details of it. 